You have to say, here's all the good things that'll happen to us when we do this and, and when we're successful at it. And here's all the bad things that'll happen to us if we, if we aren't or if we don't do it. Welcome to the Productivity is Podcast. I am your host, Mike Vardy, and this week on the show, Stephen L. Blue joins me. He is the author of Metamorphosis, From Rust Belt to High Tech in a 21st Century World. We had a great conversation just about how the disruption that needs to take place when you are shifting from a, a company that makes ru- like like basically low-tech or Rust Belt products to high-tech products. Um, we talk about pl- the planning phase and what's involved there. We talk about patience. We talk about fear. We talk about all the things that you wouldn't think that that would be related to time and productivity, but there's some definite lines that can be drawn here. And uh, the idea of metamorphosis and making change, um, it's not a fast process. It's something that takes a, a period of time for it to happen. I mean, you think about the, t- when I hear about metamorphosis, I think of like the, the caterpillar that changes into the, the butterfly, you know, and, and the idea that the caterpillar has a role and then, you know, uh, ultimately it, it morphs into this butterfly, which has a completely different role, a different life of its own. And I think that there's a lot of lessons that can be learned in this book, as well as in this episode. So let's get to this conversation now that I have with Stephen L. Blue here on the Productivity podcast. Enjoy. I'd like to welcome Stephen Blue to the Productivity is Podcast. Stephen, thanks for joining me today. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I want to, you, you've got this book called Metamorphosis, From Rust Belt to High Tech in a 21st Century World. Met, metamorphosis is like this idea, this element of change and, 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 and an evolutionary change, wouldn't you say? Like, what, can we talk a little bit about what metamorphosis means to you? And, and specifically, and we don't want to spend a lot of time here necessarily, but in the context of what you've put inside of this book. Well, to, to be perfectly honest, my publisher liked that title. I had a different title for it, uh-huh. it was, and it used to, it was uh, "Fat, Dumb, and Happy CEOs from <laughs> Rust Belt to High Tech." Yeah, they, you know, uh, they didn't laugh at it though. They don't like that title anyway. They uh, and you know, it was an appropriate title, and I and I understood it. But uh, as a matter of fact. The contents of the book is how a company can go through a metamorphosis, if you will, from where they are to where they need to be. And it's sort of an iterative process. It is not it's not necessarily a big bang. It's more like a slower to medium timed uh, uh, change. Well, and, and I used to work for, and, and a lot of people have listened to the show before, I used to work for Costco, big company, oh, yeah. um, but but very nimble, right? Like they put things in place that allowed them to be nimble so that they could steer that culture ship, maybe not as slowly as some. And I think that's a big thing, right? Like companies, when they're, when they're making changes, um, they have to do, th- largely, the belief is that they have to steer the culture ship slowly. Is that something that you find to be a, a widely held belief? And, and you talk about this idea of, innovational potential in the book too so let's does that play a role in making uh the the shift and the evolution when it comes to you know making wholesale or maybe not wholesale but evolutionary change in 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 your business well you have to have the culture has to be prepared for it and and to have a culture that's prepared for it you have to have the right kind of culture i mean that's kind of the foundation Mm -hmm. if you're going to build build this house of uh innovation and and uh, faster technology, you better have a good foundation on it. And that that takes years. And that's the part that most CEOs that I talk to, Mike, they don't like to, they don't want to hear that. Right. And I understand it because, you know, I'm just like every other CEO you're going to meet or most of them. I, I'm, you know, I'm attention deficit and I want to get things done now. And, you know, I'm a kind of gravel and guts, show me the numbers guy. But when I talk to the CEO group about uh, developing the culture, they think I'm talking the the free, the squishy free beer and pizza for lunch crowd. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not. I'm just talking about, you know, uh, having a culture that's amenable to change, having a culture that's interested in change, having a culture that's engaged in the change. And, and what I always tell people, Mike, is that the model that you want in your head for the kind of culture that you want before you try to uh, undertake this metamorphosis is uh, Mike? You've seen, I, I assume, uh, Cirque du Soleil show. Yep, yep. Actually, Canadian, Canadian born and bred. Yes, so. I know, <laughs> I, I know. And that's a that's a great c- case study in itself, uh, organizationally. I, I won't get into that, but the model that people should have in their head is uh, okay. So, what do Cirque du Soleil performers do? 
well, I, well I, I don't mean what they do. They fly through the air and all that. But they come to work every single day, and they're all jazzed up to do better today than they did yesterday. And that's that's the essence of it. And they live on the edge, and they take risks, and, uh, and uh, they plow new ground. And when I tell people that, I say, that's the kind of, don't you want that kind of an organization in, in your company? And then the retort I get is, yeah, but, you know, we're not, uh, we're not performers here, you know. People hate their jobs. And when I hear that, I say, well, guess what, Mr. CEO? If they hate their jobs, that's your fault, not theirs. Mm, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I want to talk a bit about, like, this idea, of, especially when you're dealing with CEOs. And I've talked to several over the years here on the podcast. And uh, th this idea of, of being able to make change and having this, and you talk about this in the book a little bit, about disruptional like this idea of disruptional change, uh, thinking rather, the, you know, yep. like, the, like we're seeing this and especially like where I live right now, we're, you know, uh, I live in a, in a part of Canada where things like a uh, ride sharing are, are just coming of, uh, are now finally being adopted here where, you know, when it was funny, I was in uh, Vancouver, uh, not too long ago. And I actually went to get out of the cab without paying because I'm so used to taking lifts and Ubers. <laughs> and the guy's like, wait, whoa, 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 hold on. I'm like, but that's like, so I've now adopted this mindset of, Hey, when I'm in, when I'm in a city, like, why is this disruptive business? Cause frankly, like a ride sharing business has been disruptive to the taxi cab industry. Airbnb has yep. been disruptive to the hospital. Like wh how important is it for CEOs to, to, you know, adopt this kind of disruption, th disruptional thinking. And how did, how did you, how do they do it? And maybe, maybe using yourself as an example of saying, Hey, you know, here, w the world is changing. We need to th adopt this kind of thinking so that we can, we can survive and, and better still thrive in this kind of environment. Well, it, it's a, it's an organization imperative. I mean, if, uh, if a company and a CEO isn't looking to be disruptive, let's face it, they're going to be disrupted. Mm. And I don't care what industry you're in. I don't care what business you're in. You know, everybody knows about the notable examples of disrupted industry. You made uh, mention a few, Amazon and uh, Netflix, and uh, you can go on and on. And every uh, and so they, they eventually get their way down to rust belt companies and the manufacturing companies because the guys in the manufacturing space. Uh, the fat, dumb, and happy CEOs think they're immune from this because they're not in high technology. Well, as a matter of fact, no one's immune from uh, disruptive technology. And the, and the smart ones say, okay, how do I disrupt the marketplace before I get disrupted? I'll give you a quick example. Encyclopedia Britannica, and I mm -hmm. wrote about that in the book. They're one of the few companies that uh, everybody could see the rise of digital information. I mean, everything. this wasn't a secret. Uh, everyone knew it was coming, and so did Encyclopedia Britannica. So they decided to move into the digital world before the digital world ate, had their lunch. Now, uh, it's it's arguable as to whether they've actually succeeded at that or not, because even though they did make the shift, the cultural and the operational shift into the digital world, what they their biggest mistake was they hung on to the brand and they they mistakenly assumed that the Encyclopedia brand was a strong uh, mark in today's world. And of course, you know, it's not. When you think about information, you don't think about Encyclopedia Britannica. No. And that was the biggest mistake they made. Otherwise, they might have been more successful at it. But uh, so that's just a perfect example. That if you don't look ahead to, to and believe that you're going to get disrupted, and so then you decide, okay, how do I get there before the disruptors do? Then you're just going to, you're going to be toast. Let, I want to talk about something that I've seen more and more in companies, not just startups, because I think it started with startups in a lot of ways, but this idea of the chief innovation officer. You probably, I mean, I'm sure you've seen those in, in companies that yep. are the high tech companies. Are we yep. seeing more of those in, in companies that aren't seen as traditionally high tech? And if so, if if so, what what have what have they brought to the table? If not, why not? Like, wouldn't you think that that would be something that would help with a metamorphosis? Well, you know, uh, I don't know what the trend is, and, uh, and, and I'm aware of the trend of, you know, this, this uh, position called a chief innovation officer. I would never do it. Right. And, and the reason I haven't is because uh, in my company, in anybody's company, uh, innovation should be everybody's job. Right. And when you hang a title on one guy or one department, uh, then, you know, everyone goes, well, hey, hey, you know, I, I, I don't need to do that. That's their problem. And then when they shovel it out to me, I'll resist it and say, you know, I don't understand it. We shouldn't have done it all kinds of organizational uh, snafus in my company. And this is what I suggest to all the CEOs that I know is, you know, you make that an all hands exercise, uh, not an engineering problem or, or opportunity or, or function. 
not an accounting function, not a manufacturing function. It's everybody's job to be uh, part of the innovation process. And to do that, of course, you have to train everybody in the principle, everybody in the place and the principles of innovation. And, and I did that years ago. Every single employee in my company was trained in the principle, starting with the, you know, the, the uh, fundamentals, brainstorming and, and how do you, you know, generate ideas and, and vet them and all that. And what I did is I hired the ex-chief creativity officer of the QVC network mm -hmm. to come in and train all my people in the, the principles of creativity. Now, when I did it, and it, it was on a contract basis. When I did it, everyone goes, "Are you? What are you doing? Jeez, you're a manufacturer. The QVC network is a, a, a network where women buy purses and stuff." Well, as a matter of fact, uh, as you probably know, QVC is about I don't know maybe eight billion in sales now, mm -hmm. and uh, and they grew from like a couple hundred million, and it was all in culture, all in culture. Because look at let's face it, what are they selling? They're selling handbags. They're selling cheap jewelry. They're selling, you know, small, inexpensive items at a bargain basement price. Now, how do you grow a company like that if you're not completely innovative? So what I did is it brought him in. We trained every single employee in the principles of innovation. And then for the better part of a year, he rode shotgun with all my employees. And uh, in that year, a year and a half, Mike, it might have been, we would say to them, leadership team would say, hey, we want you to work on this problem. At this particular time and this particular place, here are the uh, resources we'll let you have, and let us know what you got when you got an answer. Fast forward to well, quite a few years ago now, but now my employees all on their own decide what problems or opportunities that they're going to tackle. They decide where they're going to meet to do it. They decide they marshal their own resources. They implement their own solutions, and none of that is done uh, with a boss telling them what to do. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. Okay, I'm going to resume my conversation with Stephen in just a moment. We're going to talk about the impact of change on productivity, when he figures scale comes into play in terms of making change, and then how much time he spends in the planning phase and how that impacts his change as well. It's funny, speaking about planning, planning is one of the most critical components of one's personal productivity. And one of the things that I've struggled with, especially since I've forged out on my own, I don't have much in the way of assistance or help at this point, is planning my social media. Well, Meet Edgar has taken all of that pain away from me. And I absolutely love what they're offering. And they are offering something to Productivity as Podcast listeners, which I'll get to in just a second. But Meet Edgar is, is an amazing tool. It's helped me amplify my presence and message across multiple social networks. It can do the same for you. You can sync Meet Edgar with Facebook, with LinkedIn, which I'm spending more time on, Twitter and Instagram. And you can connect with your audience where they are when they're there. If you have a blog, like I do, a podcast like I do, or even a YouTube channel RSS feed, and that's something I've been focusing more on uh, recently. You can hook that up to meet Edgar to automatically pull in your latest content and add it to your social sharing queue. I can't wait to incorporate that now that Time Crafting TV is in full swing. You can maximize the reach of every piece of content with Edgar's unique suggested variations. What it does is it turns a single blog post or show notes from a podcast like this one into five, count them five unique social posts with a single click. It's never been easier to 5X your social media output and reach more people. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And, and I want to share Meet Edgar with you. And Meet Edgar wants to share it with you as well. You can get, get this, a 60-day extended free trial. All you need to do is head on over to meetedgar.com slash timecrafting and use the code timecrafting to get that 60-day free trial. Again, 
that, that category B scheduler that Meat Edgar offers has saved my bacon. It saved me a ton of time as well. It's, it's kept my feed active and it's posting the right content to the right network at the optimal time. There is so much that Meat Edgar has done for me that's allowed me to put my planning into other areas of my work. And I, I really have Meat Edgar to thank for that because social media now is taking care of for me. And that really, don't you want that for your social media accounts as well? So head on over to meatedgar.com slash timecrafting and use that promo code timecrafting to get an extended 60-day free trial today. You know, another critical tool that can help you with your planning is your calendar. And there is a calendar tool that I've been using for quite a while now that I'm absolutely in love with. It's called Woven. Woven Calendar is designed for busy professionals, uh, the people who want to make the most of their time because, you know, time is money for these people. They're tired of wasting time sending emails back and forth to find times to meet. That drives me nuts. They're tired of downloading, managing, and paying for multiple scheduling tools. I was very tired of doing that. Woven has taken the pain out of that for me. Uh, they want to make scheduling with clients and teams easy and hassle-free. And they want a calendar that's smart, collaborative, and designed to work the way that they work. Woven Calendar features powerful scheduling tools built into a smart, collaborative calendar. And I am in love with it. So what makes Woven so great? Well, let's start with the smart templates. You've listened to this show. You're listening to it right now. You may have been subscribed to the show for quite some time. Well, you know I have guests every single episode or mostly every episode. Well, with Woven, I can use the smart template to schedule guests. I send them the link and they can book whatever time I give them that's available in my calendar. I also do this with coaching calls and I do this with my, my web designer. I'm actually doing that with my web designer this very week. There's group polls too. So let's say you're going to do a meeting with a whole bunch of members of your team. You can have those polls there, which will help as well. The scheduling links in conjunction with the smart templates is really, really key as well. It's, it's a smart collaborative calendar. That's what Woven is. And with Woven, everything that you need to schedule is at your fingertips. Now, let me tell you, I've tried my fair share of calendar apps over the years and Woven just, they get it. It just has everything that I need and it is the most productive calendar tool that I have ever used. And I want you to add Woven to your productivity stack. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to woven.com slash timecrafting and sign up for free. Try Woven for free. Again, woven.com slash timecrafting. I am a big fan of Woven and I don't normally advocate productivity apps like this, but this is just one of those ones that I have absolutely fallen in love with. And I know if you give Woven a chance, you'll fall in love with it too. So again, woven.com slash timecrafting. Give it that free trial today. You'll be glad you did. Okay, so I'm going to do something different this episode. I'm going to put the Productivityist Podcast Pick of the Week in this break. I'm optimizing things, I guess you could say. I'm optimizing your listening experience, and this podcast will optimize you in more ways than just listening to podcasts. Stefan Spencer's Get Yourself Optimized is the Productivityist Podcast Pick of the Week. Stefan puts together an amazing podcast every single week. He's got some fantastic guests that are coming up. I know this for a fact because we've had a chance to chat about it, but he's also had some great guests in the library. David Allen's been on the show. People that you're familiar with, Nir Ayal, who was recently on this, this podcast as well. Lots of familiar faces and different takes on things too. And that's what I appreciate about Stefan's podcast. He puts a lot of time, attention, and effort into it. And I highly suggest that you add it to your productivity podcast diet. So check out Get Yourself Optimized by Stefan Spencer. It's my pick of the week. Now let's get back to my conversation with Stephen Blue. I want to talk a bit about this idea of of when you're making these changes, what impacts that has on on productivity in in its face because a lot of people are hesitant like and you talked about this initially like well, well you know making these biases that show up well if i make these changes uh you know nothing bad's going to happen you know we're fine the way it is you know that you talked about that off the off the get go but the time investment the 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 initial probably slow down in productivity uh, how do you combat something like that? Because I think that that's something that is a real fear for for companies that are shifting from this this Rust Belt kind of I, I you know, era, uh, for lack of a better term, with this Rust Belt kind of business to this high tech business. Uh, how do you, how do you help? How, what what recommendations or what advice do you have for people who are like facing that problem and and can't get past that that sense of you know what we're we, we can't afford to lose time we can't afford to it's just going to take too long or or it's, it's it seems like a waste of time uh yep. right out right out of right out of the gate 
I've heard all those excuses, uh, and, and and they're natural and they're normal. And uh, what I here's here's how I approach that. I, first, it's a big communication job, and it's a big sell job, and it's a big uh, uh, fear job in a sense, to some degree, because you know what what I would tell people constantly, including my board, by the way, because they they, they have the same fears that people on the on the factory floor do. What does this mean to us, and what happens if it's a failure, and what's it going to cost, and all that kind of stuff? So you have to tell people the truth. You have to say. Here's all the good things that'll happen to us when we do this and, and when we're successful at it. And here's all the bad things that'll happen to us if we if we aren't or if we don't do it. And there are plenty of examples out there, Mike. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you can tell people all day long <clears throat> here. But but if you're not painting both sides of the picture, if you're only painting the attractive side, people are drawn more by fear than they are by uh, what, the attraction of something better. So you have to really paint both sides of that picture. And then, then you say to people... Listen, here's what I did, Mike. I said, I expect everyone from here on out to spend 20% of their time thinking about stuff. All right, it was a little more elegant than that, but that was basically <laughs> what I said, right? And I said, and I, but, but I, 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 I'm not going to tell you that you still have to make the donuts, even though you only have 80% of your time anymore. I hired enough people to make up for that 20%. Right. And that's how, that's how, and then when you do that, of course, your costs go up. In the short run, until these great ideas and, you know, this cultural shift and all your innovation begins to develop new products, until that happens, you're going to take a cost. Hit. There's just no way around that. So you have to prepare your accountants. You have to prepare your board. You say, here's what's going to happen. And they'll go, no, 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 you shouldn't. You shouldn't hire a bunch more people. And people will naturally say, innovation, right? Well, I'll do that as soon as the real work gets done. What you have to make sure people understand, Mike, is innovation is the real work or you won't have a company in 10 years. Right. And we're seeing different ways that innovation shows up. One of the things that I, that I find fascinating with, with companies that make products is this idea of altruism showing up. You know, like I'll, I'll use uh, uh, Tom's as an example. Um, you know, I mean, lots of companies make shoes, right? But they say we're going to make every time you buy a pair of shoes from us, we make a pair to give to uh, someone who does not have a pair yeah. of shoes, right? Yeah. How... Yeah. how that's another element of, and disruption is a theme that, that is throughout this book, this idea of disruption. Um, how, you know, how much do, do things like these, and, and you could call it gimmicky, some people might call it gimmicky out of the gate, which I think, again, is a bias, is, is this this pretense of, oh, well, this is just a gimmick, but how, again, it, it ha- that's got to be infused in culture, right? That's got to be infused in, hey, you know, we are now... We're, we're, we're making these changes, we're innovating, but innovation can come in, in many different forms, like, like I just mentioned, right? Well, you know, if you, and I don't find it gimmicky at all, by the way, we've employed that uh, in our disruptive marketing sure. strategy. And, and, and today, with, uh, with the mindset of particularly younger people, uh, millennials, maybe, if you will, uh, you better be doing some of that stuff, because uh, uh, all factors equal, if you're doing it and your competition is not, you're going to get the business just because of that. Mm-hmm. And so we do that. We employ that all the time. Uh, we we contribute to, uh, we have life safety products, one of our uh, bigger uh, uh, product sets. And we contribute every time someone buys one of our systems, we contribute to, there's a fund out there uh, for the uh, the families of employees that have been killed by trains because they didn't have one of my systems or they didn't have a system like it. So we contribute money to that fund every time that uh, someone buys our system. And so and that's just anything you can do to disrupt the market because you have to get past the noise, right, Mike? Mm-hmm. Yep. And the noise is everywhere. And so uh, and sometimes it's only an incremental thing that you did that the other guys aren't doing uh, like that that uh, can make all the difference in the world. When do you kind of decide during this process that you've scaled to the level that you're comfortable with or that you are capable of? So, for example, larger companies, you know, can scale infinitely. They put f- systems in place that allow them to scale further and faster and and, 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 and maybe not better, but further and faster. Whereas smaller companies, they they may not be able to do that. Is there something, some advice you can offer to people who are like, hey, you know what, I'm, I've, you know, I, I need to make this shift. I need to, I need to make this change, but I'm just a small guy. Like I don't have like the big, I'm not a huge business, but I, I recognize I need to make this change. What kind of uh, thoughts can you, and insights do you have on people who are you know, offering more of a smaller business that, that needs to make these kind of changes and they don't, they don't necessarily either have the ability or want to scale to, to a large degree? 
Yeah, you know, I'm one of those small company guys, so I can identify with that completely. But, you know, one of the fallacies in business, Mike, is uh, every I don't care if you're uh, General Motors, General Electric, Walmart, or a little guy down the street. Uh, how many times do you hear, well, we have uh, limited resources? Mm. And, 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 and every company has limited resources. Some just have a little more limited than, than others. And, and so there's never enough money to go around. There's never enough people to go around. So you have to make choices. And what I always did is uh, we bootstrapped our way into our high technology products by what I call it. Uh, I call it in my book, Mike, I call it the spend and see plan. I spent a little bit of money on this flagship, what is now our flagship product, a very high technology product. In the beginning, I spent a little bit of money on that, and I waited to see how the market would react to it. Took it to a couple of trade shows, showed it to a couple of customers, uh, demonstrated in a few places. I got really positive feedback, so I spent a little more. Went from just basically a prototype to uh, a uh, proof, excuse me, from a proof of concept to a prototype, and yeah, then. The, the feedback was still positive there, and I spent a little more because uh, uh, I don't have the resources to, to know what I want to. If I didn't really know how the market was going to react to it, it's easy It's easy to make a product. I mean, the, the science is there. We know exactly how to do it. Whether the market will buy it or not, it's another story. So you better take it incrementally slow at, at what I call bootstrap my way into it until you're sure that the uh, marketplace wants it. Now, uh, the other guys will probably go headlong into the darn thing and, and end up designing the wrong product. Mm. And then you got to start all over again. You wasted a whole lot of money. So my spend and see approach is do a little bit, take it out there, get into the field quickly, see uh, how it uh, is received, make some tweaks in it that make sense based on what you heard in the marketplace, get it out there again, do the same thing back and forth. It took me the better part of two years, two and a half years to get my flagship product right in that iterative process. So that actually leads really nicely into my next question and, and my next thought, which is this idea of patience. As I think we, we live in a world, especially a high tech world, where fast, furious, you know, like iterate, 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 get it out, get it out, get it out, ship it, just ship it, right? We're hearing that a lot. But yep. you you talk a lot about like you just talked about something that required a great deal of patience, which is mm -hmm. seems counter to what the high tech world is screaming at us. How yeah. do you help? organizations and and within your own company especially this idea of 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 being patient uh as as this process goes through oh that's tough uh it, you've hit on a key point mike but it's really tough because uh and the tougher time is with the boards boards and shareholders who uh, when you're making this kind of transition they go you spent all this money where's the beef we mm -hmm. spent all this they're very very impatient because they don't understand what you're doing what you're trying to do, what you have to do with the, and again, the, the bigger part of the problem is with the board. Uh, you have to be part salesman, part coach, part tough guy, and you have to, what I do is I, I find ways to keep them apprised of the wins whenever I can. And and I set my ex, set the expectations with them uh, early on about, guys, this is not, we're moving into the world, out of the world we're into, the world we've been into, and this is most Rust Belt companies is, we make a part, we ship a part. We make a part, we ship a part. It's a very, you know, uh, short cycle. And, and if we do, if we do a development, it's something our customers ask for. They hand us the print. We do it, and six weeks later, we ship it. But now we're not in that world. Now we're in the world of years uh, in the making, and then in systems after that, and not sort of widget. And so you constantly have to lower the expectations of your board and your employees, and uh, constantly be painting the picture of. It is slow, but it, it but we're having these wins, and, and we're not spending money foolishly because we have the spend and see approach, and uh, this is how it's going to look on the other side. But uh, you have to – it's a constant battle, Mike, because every time I get in a board meeting uh, – well, I used to every time I got into board meeting, go, hey, where is it? Well, remember last quarter I told you <laughs> it wouldn't be here yet? And it's very tough. And the patient's probably get principle probably gets a little bit easier with every big win that you have. Like, so, yeah. you know, when, when something does get made and it does land, uh, and because again, if you're a smaller business, uh, you know, the, the, your, their patience is rewarded. And therefore the next time you come to them with something like that, they're going to be like, okay, well it worked out last time. So we, we're giving you a bit more leash. That's exactly right, Mike. What happened in the beginning of this process of our first high tech product 
my board was going, I, I don't understand. You shouldn't be doing this. I don't want to, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. I don't understand. And then when we had our first big win, it was like, yeah, we were a little skeptical at first, but now we can see it. But you better get that first big win. Yeah. You don't you don't have your whole lifetime to get it. You better get it as fast as you can. Well, and I think that, that you talk about this in the book too, is this idea of planning. And I don't think enough people sit down to deliberately plan. Whether, whether they're running a, a business such as yours or whether they're just trying to run their lives. They don't sit down and yeah, they say, yeah. you know, let's take, let's slow down for a second. Again, the speed of life is is pretty quick. What's that saying, uh, John Lennon? You know, life's pretty fast. If you don't slow down, you might miss yep. it. Um, yep. th- how much time do you spend in the planning phase, whether it's in a situation like this or just, you know, when it comes to your day to day, do you do you spend uh, more time planning than than most, would you say? Or do you do you kind of have you got a framework down that allows you to kind of, again, systemize that process so that the planning phase is just something that you can go into, deal with, get out of and move on to the next thing? Well, our, pr- our product, new product planning phase is very, very comprehensive uh, and, and very, very structured. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with all of the tools that are available to anybody, but most people don't use them. Uh, and so when we step through a new product planning phase, you know, we spend a lot of time up front in the market understanding what it is they really want, what it is they, re- excuse me, what it is they really need. Because oftentimes they don't know what they want and they don't know what they need until you show it to them. I mean, uh, the iPhone is a perfect example of that. No one knew they needed one until they had one. And so you have to spend a lot of time in the upfront and really understanding the marketplace and then really understanding what's out there now to solve a particular problem, right? Because you know, all products are supposed to solve a problem, especially new ones. So who, who's out there? What are they doing that is solving this problem? If it's not solving this problem, where is it not solving the problem? Then we dissect all the comp, co- competition offerings with with uh, with a vigor. I mean, we have spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet. We dig into their patents, see what their claims are, to see what their claims actually achieve, and where the holes and where the gaps are. And w- once you've done all of that, that's a long process, Mike. That's six months uh, if it's a day. Mm-hmm. Then you see, then things emerge. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like the filmmaking process. Pre-production takes forever. The yeah. actual production takes very little time in the middle, and then the post-production takes a lot of time, too. So the actual making takes less time than the preparing or, the, for in your case, like the, set, the marketing and, and, and the, the, the getting it out there. Yeah. And uh, what, what most companies, well, I shouldn't say most companies, what a lot of companies do is they say, well, here's a problem uh, we can solve it if we develop this product and then they apply for a patent. Right. Mm. I, do it the, I do it the other way around. I see where are the weaknesses and holes in the existing competitive patent structure. And this is like a killer spreadsheet. If you like spreadsheets, you, you'd love this one. It's like 57 pages of uh, where are all the holes in the, in the patents of the competitive offerings. In, in with respect to what the customer really wants, what the customer is really trying to solve. And you'd be amazed what that reveals. So we back into it first that way. Then we say, aha, okay, so why isn't this one addressing that? Well, it, it'd be because either the guy that, that uh, engineered the product, uh, it was his specialty, or it'll be, you know, it was convenient for, for them, or who knows. But that reveals a lot of holes and a lot of opportunities. And then we kind of take it from there. So that's where we spend most of our time. Then we do a then we do a uh, uh, pre-production or excuse me proof of concept. Get it out there, bring it back, tweak it a little bit. Proof of concept again, tweak it a little bit. So it's a very very uh, it's a multi-year process to get it done right. And, and you know I could get it done quick, and I have to do it all over again. Yeah, you can't shortchange that. Like that's oh. you can't shortchange it. Um, as we get close to wrapping up. I want to talk a little bit about this idea of when you are making the change with with your with your employees who are not used to working in the space. You touched on this in the book is that bringing out some outside contractors to help with that building of the first high tech product, or even even you know maybe working with them continuously. Is that something that people people struggle with outsourcing? You know whether they're a large company or not because there's this inherent uh, well we could do it better, or in, in maybe in a company's case like there's there's the fear like you talked about like oh well this person might come take my job or whatever. Yep. You talked about this with the QVC uh, you know person coming in and kind of you know, you know, uh, basically riding shotgun with, uh, with, with your team. Um, what, what's, what was that like when you said, Hey, we're going to bring somebody from the outside to help us develop this thing. And then the transition, like, have you transitioned to having it largely built inside? How, yeah. how did that, how did that work? 
uh, maybe not so much from a technical standpoint, but from more of a of a. Um, and I know we we don't want to spend a lot of time here, but from the from the fear based uh, standpoint of not just your board, but also your 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 employees, the people who work with you. Yeah, the, the, this part of the play is pretty much invisible to the board, but it's very visible to employees. And, uh, you know, if you're going to do this successfully, Mike, you have to have a culture that uh, is built on, among other things, trust. Mm. And and people trust me. And when I tell them, guys, nobody's going to lose their job over this, they believe me. And and so if you, if you don't have that, because that's their biggest fear, what you just said, this, this outsider will take my job. And then the second thing you have to do is you have to have whoever the outsider is, they got to be really terrific. They have to have killer uh, uh, pr- relationship skills. And right. that's, as, that's as important as them, uh, as them having the technical skills. And what I did is I selected a, a, an organization that had terrific relationship skills. They form very quickly bonds with the, our inside people. And, and, you know, people liked each other on both sides. And, and that's really essential. And then that made the transition. And then and then because they liked and trusted each other, they became a, sort of like a student and, and a teacher relationship. And the organization that I brought in to uh, help us with this, I wanted to find one that was interested, not, not in tethering to me forever, but interested in moving things into my organization. And that's how we did it. All right, Stephen, this has been a great conversation. Um, I, I really want to thank you for taking the time today. If there's one thing that you could, one, one piece of advice or one insight you can have for a, a company or, or CEO, especially since that's who we want to have, or anyone who's in a, a leadership role, an organization that's making uh, products like uh, that need to make that metamorphosis into like, hey, how do we how do we make this shift? What's the one thing that you can kind of lead them, help lead them down that path so that they get a bit of a, a decent start at, on it, maybe not a running head start, but a decent start so that they're making the right moves uh, sooner rather than later. I, that's, uh, I have an answer for that. It's very simple. Don't make mistakes, but make a lot of mistakes instead. Because if you're, if you're wrapped around the axle, I'm afraid to make a mistake in this new process that I've never done before. You won't do anything or you'll noodle it to death. And, and if you're not making a bunch of mistakes, well, I'm sure you'd agree with this, uh, Mike, in life, as well as in business, you're not trying enough. So that mm-hmm. would be my encouragement to every CEO. Stephen, that's great advice. What do they say? The the best uh, the best hitters in baseball only hit the ball what's thirty percent of the time. Thirty percent, yeah. So there you go. Uh, the book is called Metamorphosis: From Rust Belt to High Tech in a Twenty First Century World. Stephen, where can people pick up the book, and where can they learn more about you? Well, the best place to do both is on my uh, personal website, which is stephenlblue.com. S T E V E N lblue.com and they can get everything they want right from there. Stephen, thanks for joining me today on the Productivity is Podcast. My pleasure, Mike. Thanks for the time. Big thanks to Stephen Blue for joining me on the program today. You can pick up his book, Metamorphosis, From Rust Belt to High Tech in a 21st Century World by going to the links in the show notes. Go to productivityist.com slash podcast 268 and you'll get all of the stuff you need right there. If you're new to the show and you haven't listened to an episode before, there's an easy way for you to get access to the back catalog, and that's by subscribing to the podcast in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you are listening to this program, Spotify even. So if you want to make sure you don't miss a single episode, I've got a lot of great episodes coming down the pipeline, as well as a a ton in the back catalog that are well worth your time and attention. Do yourself a favor, do your productivity a favor, and subscribe to the podcast in your podcast listening app of choice. And if you're so inclined, I'd love to get a rating or review wherever you're listening to the show. Getting that feedback helps me make the show better. That's it for this week. I want to thank you for listening. Until next time, I'm Mike Vardy, the host of the Productivities Podcast, reminding you to stop guessing and start going. See you later.